welcome to tonight's monthly webinar series of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. Tonight's topic is everything you were taught about Thanksgiving is a lie. My name is Jamie Simpson and I'm a member of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement here in St. Petersburg, Florida, and I'm honored to be joined by Penny Hess, Chairwoman of the African People's Solidarity Committee. Uhuru Jamie. Uhuru Chairwoman. And I'm also joined by Jesse Neville, the, a member of the African People's Solidarity Committee and the chair of the mass front of APSC, the <coughs> Uhuru Solidarity Movement. Uhuru Jamie. Uhuru Jesse. Uhuru, Uhuru Jesse. Jesse. Penny. Uhuru comrades. So, and I want to say welcome to everyone out there tonight who's tuned in. If it's your first time tuning in to one of our webinars, thank you so much for joining us tonight. First, I'd like to salute our leadership in the African People's Socialist Party, Chairman Omali Yeshatela. <laughs> we start off by saluting our leadership in the African People's Socialist Party, Chairman Omali Yeshatela. Chairman Omali leads the African People's Socialist Party, or APSP, <clears throat> as the vanguard, the advanced detachment of the worldwide struggle of African people fighting for revolution and socialism, organizing to liberate and unify Africa and African people everywhere under the leadership of the African working class. Uhuru to the chairman who is also our leadership here in the Solidarity Movement. And we also want to especially salute chairman for the historic world-changing seventh congress he presided over in missouri this past october bringing together african people from everywhere to chart the future to chart the way forward towards a total uh, liberation and unification of africa and of african people everywhere this monumental congress began with the military color guard march to raise the raise and salute the african national flag which waved its beautiful red black and green 50 feet high above the african colony of north st louis that is liberated territory comrades i want to say uhuru to that uhuru. 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 and we, we also we also want to salute the chairman and the party and the African People's Solidarity Committee and the entire Uhuru Solidarity Movement for the momentous Days of Reparations to African People Tour that traveled to nine cities with another three viewing parties, including one in Perth, Australia, where hundreds of white people came out to these events to hear the leadership of the African Revolution. White people from all walks of life expressed sheer enthusiasm and joy to be connected to the African Revolution in unity through reparations to the black community, as well they should. Indeed, the African People's Socialist Party is the vanguard of the world revolution. We also want to salute Deputy Chair Ona Zene Yeshetela. We deeply salute Comrade Deputy Chair Ona Zene Yeshetela for leading in the creation of dual power in the hands of African workers throughout the world. The visionary leader behind the economic work of the party that is building the foundation of a liberated, socialist, anti-colonial, African working class controlled black power economy. This is most sharply exemplified today by the Black Power Blueprint in St. Louis, a magnificent political economic project wherein Deputy Chair Ona Zene went to St. Louis for a week and stayed for a year, leading the process of renovating a 9,000 square foot abandoned building into a beautiful Uhuru House Black Community Center in the heart of the impoverished African working class neighborhood in West uh, St. Louis on West Florissant Avenue, to be specific. And this project has been funded entirely by the support of the people, including Africans investing in their own future and white people like you and like us sitting right here, paying reparations to the African liberation struggle. I also want to salute our chairwoman of the African People's Solidarity Committee here with us tonight, who has been working in principled solidarity with the Black Power Movement under the leadership of the African People's uh, Socialist Party for the past 42 years, and who authored a profound book, Overturning the Culture of Violence, whose effects are still being felt throughout the world today in the War of Ideas. We want to salute Chairwoman Penny Hess. <laughs> 
And we will be hearing more from Chairwoman Penny Hess shortly. But uh, before we begin, I'd like to turn it over to Jesse Neville to tell us a bit about the organization hosting this program tonight. Uhuru Jamie, and I want to join in saluting our leadership, Chairman Omalia Shatella, the African People's Socialist Party, Deputy Chair Onizanea Shatella, and of course our Chairwoman Penny Hess. And I'm very excited for this webinar tonight and want to salute everybody for tuning in to this webinar, which is hosted by the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, which has been stated is the white organization of the African People's Socialist Party. It's the mass front of the African People's Solidarity Committee that was formed by the party in 1976 to extend the struggle for African revolution into the white oppressor nation population and to build a mass movement amongst the white population for reparations to African people, mm -hmm. to build principled white solidarity with black power through material solidarity with African self-determination and the struggle of African people for national liberation. So our mm -hmm. job is to go into the white community and organize other white people like ourselves to take this stand, to stand with the African liberation movement, and to build unity with the African community's struggle for genuine political and economic power and independence. We believe that reparations are owed to African people. We believe that the United States and European governments and corporations owe reparations, and that we, white people, all white people, owe reparations to African people. And the party has given us a strategic assignment to build a mass movement for white reparations to African people. We are a growing organization. We have people tuning in from all over the world, people who are members of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. You just mentioned we had the Days of Reparations to African People tour, which was an amazing victory for the African People's Socialist Party and this brilliant strategy of the chairman to build the Solidarity Movement. And we are uh, building in St. Louis, in Huntsville, in Gainesville, here in St. Petersburg, Florida, in New York, in Philadelphia, in Boston, in Portland, in Seattle, in Asheville. We have members in Orlando. We have members in Milwaukee, uh, in Delaware. We have members all over the place, in Oakland, California, that are building the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, as well as in Perth, Australia. And this year, we will be carrying out the call from the party to build the Solidarity Movement in South Africa or occupied Azania as it, as it is known. So we're involved in building the reparations challenge campaign to build a culture of reparations to African people in every white community throughout this country and throughout the world. And we are going to continue working under the party's leadership to build a popular culture of reparations to African people. So we encourage people to join, to join the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. And um, we are doing this webinar as a monthly webinar that is part of a weekly webinar series that the Black Power Blueprint does um, every single week. So, Uhuru. Uhuru, and thank you, Jesse. Tonight's webinar is uh, connected, as uh, Jesse said, to the Black Power Blueprint Reparations Funding Campaign, coordinated by Chairwoman Penny Hess. And uh, tonight, we do have a goal to raise $1,000 for the Black Power Blueprint. Tonight, we are already at, for the year, uh, 10523 dollars and 53 cents or sorry ten thousand five hundred and twenty three dollars which is 53 percent of our goal all right so, all right. Hurry to that thank you to everyone who contributed to that and we want to get to eleven thousand five hundred dollars tonight right. let's do this we've done it before you've helped us do it before we know we can do it again we must do it again so uhuru you can be part of that. And the first phase of this campaign did raise thousands of dollars for the renovation of a beautiful Uhuru house where the recent, much of the recent 7th Congress of the African People's Socialist Party was held. You were a big part of making that happen. Everyone who is watching tonight has contributed and everyone who has contributed up to this point helped make that happen. And because of you and your support, these past, these, uh, past weekly webinars and the amazing Black Power Blueprint project, phase two was then able to go into effect with the demolition of two condemned buildings across the street from the new Uhuru House to make room for the founding of a One Africa, One Nation marketplace, which will stimulate black community co uh, commerce for and between African people. A 50-foot flagpole was also raised to prepare for the unveiling of the tremendous red, black, and green flag. So we are now into stage 2.2 of the funding phase as the project gears up to renovate the Boathouse building. 
in St. Louis as the site of the future Uhuru Jiko Community Commercial Kitchen, another fantastic dual power program that will serve as the seed of the independent African economy and the seizure of power over the means of food production and distribution in the hands of the African working class. This is an incredibly uh, critical task. Mm -hmm. So you can contribute to this. You can be a part of this goal by going to blackpowerblueprint.org and we will announce your donations and statements throughout the program tonight. Jesse, back to you. Thank you, Jamie. Uhuru. And I want to unite with what you just said that we are going to make this goal tonight. Everybody watching this is involved in that of raising $1,000, which means to be exact that the uh, Black Power Blueprint should be at $11,523 because mm -hmm. um, we want to raise a minimum of $1,000 tonight. So we encourage you, don't delay. Just go there right now, blackpowerblueprint.org. Get your card out and make your contribution. And as soon as you do, we will announce it. Um, oh, it looks like we've already got. We gotten have some. twenty-five dollars. All right. All right. Uhuru. Uhuru. Uh -huh. Robert Wood. Robert Wood. Robert, Robert Wood. Wood. Okay, twenty-five dollars. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Thank you. So nine hundred and seventy-five to go, and please keep the interruptions coming. We will take a minute and mm -hmm. announce it and give you a shout out because we appreciate you. And every time we do that, it inspires somebody else to contribute. So mm -hmm. your contribute has echoes. So mm -hmm. please go ahead, blackpowerblueprint.org, and make it happen. So. Um, without any further ado, tonight we're talking about this issue of Thanksgiving. I'm very excited for Chairwoman Penny Hess's presentation and very glad that uh, Chairwoman Penny could be with us tonight. And Thanksgiving is coming up, so you're going to see lots of turkeys, pilgrims, you know, and little cutesy, idyllic representations of this holiday all over the place and um, possibly go home to Thanksgiving dinner uh, with your family, and um, which, you know, in the white community often means some kind of horrendous fight breaking out or drunken slovenliness uh, occurring. But um, what we want to talk about tonight is what is the real story behind this myth of Thanksgiving? Because I grew up hearing about these little peaceful dinners between the, the pilgrims and the Indians and, and what really happened there. What really happened? And we're going to talk about that. Chairman Penny Hass is going to break that down for us tonight. What is this holiday that celebrates the genocide and the theft of land from the indigenous people? Uh, what is it meant? What purpose does it serve in covering up that reality and justifying that system? So we want to start off by saying that you know this is not only timely to have this webinar because of Thanksgiving, but also because you know we hear this thing that America is the original nation of immigrants, and as Chairman Amali Shetela has said. Uh, America is one, not a nation, and two, it, you know, African people are not immigrants, they were brought here as captives. And we came here, white people came here as colonizers. And right now you hear this whole immigration issue with the caravan of people who are coming to get back on their own land, are being criminalized as illegal aliens. And we intend to bring some African internationalist clarity to this discussion tonight, thanks to uh, the presence of Chairwoman Penny Hess. So, that's what we're going to talk about. Before we launch into this extremely important discussion, we have a brief uh, nine minute or so video from Benjamin Prado, who is one of the leaders of Union del Barrio, a very powerful Mexican indigenous national liberation organization that has worked in profound uh, fraternal unity and solidarity with the African People's Socialist Party for 35 years, over 35 years and is fighting to reclaim all of the land of the indigenous people, as they say, from Alaska to Chile in the hands of the indigenous people. This is a presentation that was given at the uh, Black is Back Coalition's annual March on the White House um, this past November 3rd. So Kyle is gonna take us to a clip of Benjamin Prado speaking at the Black is Back Coalition. Uhura. That gave, that struggled against them when they landed, whether it be on Plymouth Rock or whether it be in Mayhem, Mayhem, we see our struggle as a continuation of a struggle of 1492, yes. more than 500 years of struggle against European settler colonialism. Yes. Yes. And we say that the only way that we are going to defeat this sick parasitic system is by uniting and organizing yes. ourselves with the rest of humanity who is struggling to free itself from the boot of this terrible monster imperialist beast known as U.S. capitalism and imperialism. Yes. Yes. Sisters. You know, the situation in, in right now, you know, as uh, the situation in, in Mexico and the rest of Latin America, 
Uh, we, we, we understand and recognize that there has been a serious force that has been trying to overturn this parasitic relationship with the United States and, uh, by, by our comrades that are struggling in Cuba, Venezuela, Bolivia, Ecuador, and, and, uh, and um, Nicaragua, who have formed the Bolivarian Alliance for the Peoples of Nuestra America. And to us, we see that as the future, that we must unite with our comrades and sisters in the South because in totality, we are, we are way more than the U.S. population. We see ourselves as part of our brothers and sisters uh, throughout this continent who are waging a fierce struggle to free itself and unhitch itself from U.S. capitalism and imperialism. And we see our, our struggle as being part of, of, of that struggle in the South. And so we see, the, we say, nuestro norte es el sur. Our north, our political north, is in, is in the south, beyond that imperialist political border that was imposed. And there is a reason why we see so many people fleeing uh, Honduras today, as you have seen in the news, right? And it's because Obama, who authorized the invasion and the overthrow of a democratically elected government in Manuel Zelaya. We recognize that. So we do say, and we do unite with that call, that Obama is a white nationalist, yes. just like yes. Trump is, yes. right? Yes. Yes. And, and, and it's important and significant for us because we know that the reason why they attacked Manuel Zelaya, why they overthrew him, is because he decided to join the Bolivarian Alliance of the Peoples of Nuestra America. Mm. Just like Gaddafi was trying to create and unhitch uh, 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 and build an economy away from U.S. capitalism and build its own monetary system. We know that that's the reason why uh, Gaddafi was was uh, killed, lynched, massacred, right? And it's the same reason why they uh, overthrew uh, Manuel Zelaya because he was willing to say no to U.S. capitalism and imperialism and shift away from, from the U.S. and join the Bolivarian Alliance of the Peoples of Nuestra America. And the consequence of that has been terror, has been violence, has been a, a perpetual exploitation of our people's uh, wealth and resources, that people can no longer live in Honduras under the vicious, sick, U U.S. sponsored state terror that exists there, and people are leaving. And the U.S. knew this. The U.S. knew this and created a whole policy around, around war in Mexico with the Plan Merida, with Plan, uh, 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 the, the Plan Merida, which is a military uh, occupation of Mexico. They put forces in Mexico. Mexico is not a sovereign nation. It is a puppet regime of U.S. capitalism and imperialism. And we recognize that. And the only way that we're going to be able to get out of this is if we organize revolutionary forces in the South to be able to uh, form part of a united front against this terrible sick system that can only offer death and destruction. And we don't rec And one thing that's important for us as Mexicanos living on our own land, right, because we do recognize that we are on our own land, California, Arizona, Nuevo Mexico, Texas, Colorado, stolen Mexican land, brothers and sisters stolen indigenous native lands. And we don't recognize those political borders that they impose on us because our peoples have been migrating since before there was the United States of America. And we recognize our intrinsic right to migrate wherever the hell we please on our own land as an indigenous nation. The question here is why are we migrating? We migrate because of capitalism has, has imposed a terrible situation in Mexico as part of the North American Free Trade Agreement, the parasitic system that is continuing to extract our resources. And just like that, we know and recognize that Africa is not poor, Mexico is not poor. Right. It is being looted. Yes. And we unite with that right. analysis to know that the, that, the, that the only way you can have all this uh, wealth in this country is because it's been stolen from peoples around the world. Yes. Right. And that is fundamentally unsustainable. Yes. There's no way that 5% of the world's population can live with 35% of the people's natural resources the world over without, without imperialism and without war. Yes. We know that. It cannot, it cannot exist because what it represents is the theft of people's natural resources, their ability to even live. Right. And so the only way to really get out of this is, is to unite with, with uh, you brothers and sisters. 
unite with the revolutionary forces that are trying to overturn this terrible system that, that exists on, on humanity today. And the only way that we can do that is, is again, uniting ideologically, uniting in action. What we're gonna be doing today is marching to that White House and telling that imperialist pig yeah. that we don't want him, uh, we don't want him, we don't respect him, and we, and we denounce his, his sick laws that try to criminalize our people on our own land. Yeah. No, today, we're suffering a terrible reality where immigration authorities are coming into people's homes, uh, kidnapping us, putting us in these concentration camps known as prisons that are fundamentally there to make a, turn a profit for these private corporations that, that invest in building prisons. And we know that the whole immigration system is based on a lie, that we are not illegals, we are, we are, we are human beings on our own land, and that we will continue to work uh, to, to uh, abolish every single law, colonial law, that attempts to deny our basic humanity and that we are going to continue to organize ourselves to defend our families from all these right. terroristic organizations known as ICE or Border Patrol that continue to uh, kill and lynch our, our people, uh, modern day lynches with shootings and killings uh, as they've done with impunity for way too long. And right. today, brothers and sisters, we are proud to be here. We are glad to be marching with you to the uh, white man's house, uh, that we need to definitely send a message uh, that organization of revolutionary struggle is alive and well here in the belly of the beast within US imperialism, and that we form part of a larger struggle and movement throughout Latin America and, the, and throughout the world to reclaim our land, reclaim our resources, and to put that a thousand blows against this terrible, sick, parasitic system. Thank you very much, comrades. Uhuru. Que viva la raza, as we would say. Que viva el pueblo organizado. Que viva! Tierra y libertad, brothers and sisters. Uhuru. 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 Wow. That was so powerful. Benjamin Faro of Union de Barrio. Incredible organization, we're very grateful. Who has been a guest on one of yes, these webinars in the past. Right. Thank you, comrade. Um, very timely statements. And I also want to say thank you to David Rold. Uhuru David Uhuru, Rold. Uhuru David Rold, who donated $20. Thank you. And shout, out, shout out to David Rold, who also came to three of the Days of Reparations to African people. So. Oh, all right, comrade. That's dedication. We appreciate it. And we, uh, we thank everyone who's given up until this point. And we want to encourage people not to forget and continue to go to blackpowerblueprint.org and donate towards that goal of raising $1,000 tonight. We are, uh, we still have $955 of the way uh, to get there and we're going to get there tonight. Uh, this goes towards the Black Power Blueprint, which builds dual power in the hands of the African working class in St. Louis, Missouri. As I mentioned earlier, this uh, is, has to do particularly with the African Independent Workforce Program and the Boathouse, turning that into a vehicle for uh, food distribution and, and in food production being in the hands of the African working class. I've said enough. And now, without much uh, further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Chairwoman Penny Hess. Uhuru, Chairwoman Penny. Uhuru, Uhuru. And thank you, thank you, Jamie, and thank you, Jesse, Uhuru Solidarity Movement, for this um, excellent program tonight. I also want to join in saluting Chairman O'Malley Shatella, who has given me and those of us in the African People's Solidarity Committee the ability to analyze the world as it truly is, to mm -hmm. become African internationalists, which is is, is so liberating, even for us, that gives us the ability to start to stand on the forward side of history and in unity with the vast majority of the people on the planet Earth. Mm -hmm. I want to salute Deputy Chair Onis Inea Shetela. Uh, I have a tremendous honor of working under her leadership on building reparations and this campaign in solidarity with the Black Power Blueprint, which she leads, which she has done such an amazing job and continues to do at such a rapid pace. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can, Jamie talked about it a little bit, but you can go to blackpowerblueprint.org and while you're donating and paying reparations tonight, you can also look at numerous videos and pictures and photographs and writing, writing up about the enormous breadth of this incredible project called the Black Power Blueprint. 
that is bringing um, so much um, hope and excitement on the north side of, of St. Louis, Missouri, which is a very impoverished and oppressed African colony. And I also want to you know, salute the party on the 7th Congress, which was in St. Louis for a week in uh, October, which was just amazing. You can see many of those videos, or perhaps every day, at the, uh, on the Burning Spear YouTube site. And I also want to salute Uhuru Solidarity Movement for the fantastic and powerful Days of Reparations to African People tour that we just completed. And you know every organizer did an outstanding job. We were in nine cities, and it was just electrifying to see the openness of white people and the building of this historic solidarity movement. So, you know, and just, we're just coming off of that and um, we're so excited to be building towards the future. I wanna salute Uhura Solidarity Movement for its milestone of 500 members, which is gonna be, gonna be doubled really in the next several months. And this is yeah. the growing organization under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party. So I you know, have the honor of talking tonight about this question of genocide, genocide against the indigenous people. And I just want to start by saying that to celebrate a national day of giving thanks for living in a country in which genocide was carried out against the indigenous people and their land was stolen, living in a country that has wealth and prosperity for us at the expense of the assault on Africa, the enslavement of African people, and the theft of their labor and land and resources for the past 500 or more years is, is truly one of the most deeply repulsive things that I can think of. You know, yeah. to have a day of Thanksgiving. A lot of times for white people, this is their favorite holiday. Mm -hmm. Um, a day we're supposed to eat ourselves to death. We're supposed to, um, you know, be with family, and often, as has been said, that can be very disastrous, and et cetera, based on the subjectivism that we have and too much alcohol and all of this kind of thing that, that we are doing on this day. Um, but to create such a holiday is the act of a settler nation, the act of a colonizing people. So the African People's Solidarity Committee, which I'm the chair of, is an organization of the African People's Socialist Party. And it is a, a strategic organization that is part of the actual strategy of the party to insert the African revolution wherever it can. And we just saw a magnificent presentation by Benjamin Prado of Union de Barrio which is an organization of Mexican-speaking indigenous people um, most, uh, that is based in San Diego and Southern California and Texas and other places where Mexican people are concentrated inside the borders of the United States, which is actually the land of the indigenous people, the land of Mexico that was stolen from Mexico in 1848. Um, and that is an organization that the party has had a very, very strong relationship with for many years, for 30 years or so. And you know, it, so this is part of the party's strategy to win as many um, places, groups, and nationalities, including white people, that it can to recognize the right of African people to freedom and independence. So. Um, one of the things that you know, we have the responsibility to do is to go inside the white community and to win other white people to expose the reality of the role that we have played as the colonizer nation, to win reparations to African people, and to recognize, as the party told us from day one, that the struggle is not against racism, the struggle is against colonialism. And you know, just to say that colonialism is a policy or practice of acquiring control 
over another country or people, occupying it with settlers who act as the state and exploiting it economically for the benefit of the entire oppressor nation. So it is, it is a, a policy, it is an action of an imperialist state, and it involves the entire white population. And I say white because white power and imperialism go together. Racism, on the other hand, is, which is something that Chairman O'Malley Chatella calls um, the underpinning, the ideological underpinning of the colonialism, of colonialism and the colonial policy of imperialism. If you look up racism, and I just looked at it in, a, in you know, the dictionary, it's saying that racism is prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism directed against someone of a different race based on the belief that one's own race is superior. And so racism is the thoughts or actions of a person or even, even a group. But colonialism is the economic and political strategy of an imperialist government and state based on unity from the entire white nation, including workers and others. So colonialism is built on imperialism and the system of parasitic capitalism, and it uses the state to carry out goals to enslave, rape, pillage, and steal land and wealth. And its tools are the white settler population who are deputized to carry out colonial policy. And to me, few things, few things illustrate this <clears throat> more clearly than the popular white genocide against the indigenous people of the United States and basically of the Americas. So, you know, we can also see these terror um, and uh, th this terrorism carried out by, by white working people called the lynchings of which, from which no white person was ever indicted or, or spent any time in prison or went to court for. So it was basically legal and white people were deputized to carry out this. this. And, you know, this, this same kind of thing was there um, as the genocide. The genocide did not happen just by the US state. It happened with the total complicity of the white population. So I want to talk about that a little bit when we talk about Thanksgiving. First of all, I want to say that if you want to read some books about it, there are some books that I highly value. There are differences. These books do not necessarily have an African internationalist point of view, but they give you so much information that it is just really powerful. And the first one is the classic book, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, by um, D, um, Brown. D. Brown. D. Brown. This just gives a tremendous history. So I salute that book. I've read that book a, a few different times. I really urge people to read it. <clears throat> Another book that actually I'm going to quote from tonight is called American Holocaust by David Stannard, who is a professor. The reason, I mean, this book is very, very thorough. And what I really appreciate about this book is that it, first of all, deals with the genocide in North and South America and the Caribbean, because a lot of times that's mm -hmm. separated out. And it also, is the only book that I know of that gives a amazing picture of what some of the civilizations that were the indigenous civilizations were like and what daily life was in, you know, like in it and how it was destroyed by Europeans. So, you know, it gives a it gives a very large picture here of, you know, what really happened. And it's very, very profound. There's also the book a Little Matter of Genocide by Ward Churchill. And in the book, Overturning the Culture of Violence, which is the book that we wrote from the African People's Solidarity Committee, we do quote some of these things very briefly because we don't have you know, the time in there, but to really talk about this whole question of what it took to create the, um, not only capitalism, 
but to create the North American or the, the um, Americas, you know, the ability for white people, all white people, to sit on this pedestal of the oppression of African and indigenous people as Americans walking up the ladder of success at the expense of hideous genocide against the indigenous people. So I just want to say that, yeah, when the indigenous, when the Europeans came to the US, the indigenous people welcomed them as they were very hospitable people. The indigenous people had no words or concepts for land ownership, lies, dishonesty, or for the kind of violence that white people inflicted upon them. So they welcomed the indigenous people, they t or the European people. They taught them how to um, farm and to, you know, be able to survive in the North American terrain. But it didn't take long at all for indigenous people to realize that this was an invasion, that this was genocide, that their, their lives, their very lives were threatened. And so very soon the indigenous people fought and resisted fiercely the European invasion. So there were great um, indigenous generals who led brilliant resistance such as Crazy Horse, Sitting Bull, and battles such as Little Bighorn, where the indigenous, the Lakota people um, killed um, General George Armstrong Custer, who was the North American general who had very much had um, aspirations to become president, to run for president of the United States, and they wiped out that aspiration, you know, for one. And, you know, there was the Battle of Wounded Knee, there was Tippy Canoe, the Battle of Tippy Canoe, led by Tecumseh, and so many more. You know, there were so many brilliant, brilliant things. But I wanted to take one example. I wanted to take one example of the genocide because, you know, I could give you many, many things, and we could talk about this for hours. We could have a whole day of discussing what white people did to the indigenous people. But I want to take one example that I feel is, is chilling because it not only says what happened, but it also shows the complicity and the unity of white people in it. And that is what is called the Sand Creek Massacre in Colorado in 1864, in the winter in November of 1864. Um, this was led by, I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read a little bit here because I can't really recreate it in my words. It's better to read this. And a lot of what I'm reading here, which this is from the book American Holocaust, is actual records, U.S. court records of some of the white people who witnessed it and were, went and had to give a testimony of what happened there. So this is an actual words of, of white people who are on the scene. And it, this battle, this massacre, this murder, this genocidal act was led by um, Colonel John Shivington who um, was, who led the, the volunteer cavalry of Colorado. And this was in a time when, by the 1860s, the Cheyenne and the Arapaho people had pretty much already been pushed out of Colorado territory, um, even though the city of Denver, actually in previous treaties, belong, you know, even according to U.S. records and treaties, belong to the Cheyenne and the Arapaho. But of course, we know that that means absolutely nothing. So by this time, settlers, white settlers, were already building Denver. They were already um, taking over the land of the, um, the Cheyenne and the Arapaho. And so the Cheyenne and Arapaho joined together to fight and to you know, just even be able to hunt on this land. And they were being attacked by a conscious policy of, of genocide. So I just want to read a little bit about this. 
This is talking about the Sand Creek Massacre in Colorado, November 29th, 1864. It says, the air was cold and crisp, the early morning darkness just beginning to lift when they entered the snowy village on November 29th. And that means Shivington and his volunteer army of white settlers. The creek was almost dry, the little water in it crusted over with ice, untouched yet by the dawn's first rays of sun. The cavalrymen paused and counted well over a hundred lodges in the encampment. Within them, the native people were just stirring, as had been the case in the Pequots in Connecticut more than 200 years earlier. What a similar kind of thing. And, and, and he says, and with countless other native peoples across the continent since then. So, so many early morning raids had wiped out the encampments of indigenous people. It says, this village was filled almost entirely with women and children who had no inkling of what was about to happen. Most of the men were away on a buffalo hunt. One of the colonel's guides, Robert Bent, later reported that there were about 600 indigenous people in camp that morning, including no more than 35 braves and some old men, about 60 in all. The rest were women and children. So I want to read some of the testimony of white people and this Robert Brent and others who were there who were there. Robert Brent was forced to be a guide. He was, um, apparently his family was indigenous and Chivington told him that he would kill them all if he didn't um, ride with them and, you know, be the traitor. So Brent says, so first of all, they went into, they were camped by a river and the creek and they, um, Chivington went in, he had about 700 men and they immediately opened fire against the women and children. So Brent says, after the firing, the warriors put the, and I'm not going to use the word squaw because that's a horrible name from what I understand. I'm going to say the women. Um, firing, after the firing, the warriors put the women and children together and surrounded them to protect them. And these are old men, these are old people, because again, all the young men were out hunting. I saw five women under a bank for shelter. When the troops came up to them, they ran out and showed their persons to let the soldiers know that they were women and begged for mercy, but the soldiers shot them all. There were some 30 or 40 women collected in a hole for protection. They sent out a little girl about 60, six years old with a white flag on a stick. She had not proceeded but a few steps when she was shot and killed. All the women in that hole were afterwards killed and four or five men, a hideous name for men, outside. The, the women offered no resistance. Everyone I saw dead was scalped. I saw one woman cut open with an unborn child, as I thought, lying by her side. Captain Sewell afterwards told me that such was the fact. I saw quite a number of infants in arms killed with their mothers. So, you know, he goes on to say that <clears throat> I went over the ground soon after the battle. I should judge there were between 400 and 500 Indians killed. Nearly all men, women, and children were scalped. I saw one woman whose privates had been mutilated. The bodies were horribly cut up, skulls broken in a good many. I judge they were broken in and after they were killed as they were shot besides. I do not think I saw any but what was scalped. I saw fingers cut off to get the rings off them. And I saw several bodies with privates cut off, women as well as men. Next morning after the battle, I saw a little boy covered up among the Indians in a trench, still alive. I saw a major in the 3rd Regiment take out his pistol and blow off the top of his head. 
I saw some men unjointing fingers to get rings off and cutting off ears to get silver ornaments. I saw a party with the same major take up bodies that had been buried in the night to scalp them and take off ornaments. I saw a woman with her head <clears throat> smashed in before she was killed. Next morning, after they were dead and stiff, these men pulled out the bodies of women and pulled them open in an indecent manner. I heard men say they had cut out the privates, but I did not see it myself. And he goes on to say that I saw some indigenous people that had been scalped and their ears cut off of the body of white antelope. Um, <clears throat> one indigenous had been scalped, had also had his skull all smashed in. And I heard that the privates of white antelope had been cut off to make a tobacco bag out of. I heard some of the men say that the privates of one of the women had been cut out and put on a stick. The dead bodies of women and children, this is still testimony, were afterwards mutilated in the most horrible manner. <clears throat> um, I saw only eight. I could not stand it. They were cut up too much. They were scalped and cut up in an awful manner. White antelope's nose, ears, and privates were cut off. All matter of depredations were inflicted on their persons. They were scalped, their brain, this is another person, their scalp, their brains knocked out. The men used their knives, ripped open women, clubbed little children, knocked them in the head with their guns, beat their brains out, mutilated their bodies in every sense of the word. Worst mutilation than I had ever saw before. The women cut to pieces, children two and three months old, all ages lying there from sucking infants to warriors. In going over the battleground the next day, I did not see a body of a man, woman, or child, but was scalped. And in many instances, their bodies were mutilated in the most horrible manner, men, women, and children's privates cut out, etc. I heard one man say, that he had cut out a woman's private parts and had them for exhibition on a stick. I heard another man say that he had cut off the fingers of an Indian to get the rings on the hand. I also heard of numerous instances in which men had cut out the private parts of females and stretched them over their saddle bows and wore them over their hats while riding in the ranks. I heard one man say that he'd cut a squaw's a woman's heart out, and he had stuck it upon a stick. So this was the testimony that was of the witnesses, of the eyewitnesses for this, this massacre. And um, once the carnage was over, the silence of death descended on the killing field. Colonel Shivington sent messages to the press that he had, he and his men, had successfully concluded, quote, one of the most bloody Indian battles ever fought, in which one of the most powerful villages in the Cheyenne Nation was destroyed. Um, there was exultation in the land. Cheyenne scalps are getting as thick here now as toads in Egypt. Joke, the Rocky Mountain News. Isn't that still the paper of Denver? I think it is. Everybody has got one and is anxious to get another one. Outside of Colorado, not everyone was pleased. So the US congressional um, investigations were ordered. Not that we know that the US Congress gave a damn about this, mm -hmm. but they did send Congress into Denver. And um, it said that one senator who visited the site of the massacre, they were sent from Washington, DC into Denver picked up skulls of infants whose milk teeth had not yet been shed. Um, so it goes on to say that, um, that there was, they assembled a committee and invited the general public to come to the Denver Opera House. And every floor of this opera house was packed to the gills. And during the course of the discussion, this is led by these congressmen, they, who were obviously part of this, but they, were, they asked the question, one of the congressmen asked the question to the white people, the thousands of white people in that opera house, 
after, you know, a few a week or so or whenever it was after this horrible, this hideous massacre, he said, would it be best henceforward to try to civilize the indigenous people or simply exterminate them? Whereupon the senator wrote in a letter to a friend, quote, there suddenly arose such a shout as is never heard unless upon some battlefield, a shout almost loud enough to raise the roof of the opera house, quote, exterminate them, exterminate them. So that is the story of the Sand Creek Massacre. And I don't think that they're, you know, it just sums it all up. That is yeah. one of the most hideous, although there, as I said, there are every single one was that. But it te mm -hmm. this tells the story of that. And, you know, so we talk about what this country and white people and the state did to the indigenous people that after, you know, after that, that um, act, the Sand Creek Massacre, Theodore Roosevelt justified it mm -hmm. and said that it was a righteous and beneficial deed mm -hmm. that would happen on the, you know, that needed to happen on the frontier. Mm -hmm. And of course, the chant of that genocide was, um, was called uh, Manifest Destiny. Mm -hmm. the right of white people to go in and steal the land and, and commit genocide. So, you know, we're talking about the fact that at least six million African people were killed in the process of assaulting Africa and enslaving African people. And of course, a hundred million were actually enslaved and, and lived, but 60 million, it's estimated, were killed in that process. And that millions more African people were killed as part of colonialism in Africa, in the Congo, under King Leopold in Belgium, in his um, quest to force African people on their own land to be enslaved, to grow and harvest rubber, which African people, of course, did not want to do and resist it, and 10 million African people were killed, slaughtered under King Leopold and under Belgium. And those who weren't slaughtered, Belgium cut off the hand of men, women, and children who resisted in any way. And there, you can also read in other books the story of the hands that eyewitnesses, Europeans, said that they were like mountains of hands and in Namibia, the Herero and Nama people, um, the Africans who lived there were killed in, um, by the Germans, the German colonizers, in a very, very hideous way that brought, that forced the Herero and Nama out into the middle of the desert, surrounding them and leaving them out there without shelter or water or food until they died, until they were killed. Um, but they have never paid reparations. Germany has never paid reparations to the Africans. And in mm -hmm. the ivory trade um, in Madagascar and, and in other parts of, of Africa, um, many, many millions of Africans were also killed. And then we know that 100 million Africans, uh, indigenous people at least, were slaughtered in the Western Hemisphere, and probably much more than that. Um, but there was no word for genocide until Jews were killed by other Europeans, till basically Europeans killed other Europeans in Germany in the 1940s. Mm -hmm. yep. And everything prior, all of the genocide, all of the mass slaughter was taken for granted right. as manifest destiny mm -hmm. as the basis of colonialism as as it says on here you know nits and i don't know lice they call them right. they have to be exterminated they have to be dealt with mm. and you know we know that 
there was no word for Germany for genocide until the Jews were killed in Germany. And by the way, also a completely um, same proportionate number of Roma people yeah. were slaughtered as well. That's never talked about, mm -hmm. proportionate to the size of their population. Mm -hmm. right. And it was like 1.5 million people mm -hmm. um, were also slaughtered by the Germans. But there was no word for that until 1947 when there were the Nuremberg trials and the definition of genocide for the first time. And Lemkin, is it Raphael? Lemkin, mm -hmm. who was one that came up with the word genocide, was very, very hostile to and absolutely refused to use that word mm -hmm. for indigenous, the gen genocide against the indigenous people and against Africans and others around the world who were victimized in mass by this colonial policy of white power, which is bloody and, and vicious. And that you know, Zionism and this whole question of genocide works hand in hand to justify what white people in Israel are doing to the Palestinian people, the theft of their land and the ongoing genocide and terror and colonial um, just oppression, most serious oppression, which is even going on right now as we speak, it's intensifying again. Um, against the Palestinian people on their own land, and and you know as is always the case, they are a settler colonizer force there. So I just wanted to read quickly what is the definition of genocide under the United Nations, and this is some of the um, some of the aspects of genocide, which is our following acts committed to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group, including killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, desperately inflicting on members of the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group, all of which, all of which were carried out against the indigenous people and African people and still are, mm -hmm. and still are today. So genocide is ongoing. It is something that comes about through colonialism and it takes place through unity of the colonial state power and you know its tool, the white population that is the settler colonial population. Um, I also, you know, I just also want to say that that the African People's Socialist Party is very, very serious about the liberation of Africa, of uniting African people all around the world to into this party, the African People's Socialist Party, and on its international scale, which is called the African Socialist International, to come together with the leadership of the African working class to liberate Africa, to completely destroy all of the borders imposed on it by colonialism and Europe, and to have the return of its stolen resources and to build a socialist society in which African workers are empowered and have control of the means of production and of state power to protect their um, socialist government. And that the, you know, for us to be a strategy, to be an organization of the African People's Socialist Party, this offers us the ability, the chance to join humanity, to, to take responsibility for this history of which this we talked about tonight is just one little example of everything that we have participated in and that we still do, that we're complicit in, that we um, have 
earned money from, that we have stolen money from, that we have had the ability to have social wealth and everything else. And I also want to say that you know, we heard the statement from Benjamin Prado, Prado and the Union de Barrio and that a lot of times white people, you know, if we're talking about solidarity with the liberation of Africa and African people, then they want to say, well, what about the indigenous people? Right. Which is really foul. Yeah. Really mm -hmm. foul, first of all, because what were they doing something about that? Right. You know, as white people, were they doing something to be in solidarity with the indigenous people? Mm -hmm. No, they never are. But secondly, that the relationship between the African People's Socialist Party and the indigenous people of this entire hemisphere is so deep and profound that the chairman has said, you know, that that the African revolution inside the borders of the United States is also part of the revolution of the Americas. Mm -hmm. And the revolution of the Americas is premised upon the right of the indigenous people to have their land back, and they mm -hmm. will have it back without borders, their own land. This is the inevitable course of history. And that, the chairman has said, it's practically the same struggle. That right. their relationship, their commitment to indigenous liberation, the fact that this land belongs to the indigenous people and they will be free, is part and parcel of the African revolution. That's how deep it is. It is the same thing. It is intertwined, as just as we heard a, um, you know, a, a solidarity statement at the Congress from an indigenous group based in the Caribbean and South America saying that the history of Africa, you know, of the indigenous people, they call the Olmec, um, which was from Africa, they call that the mother culture mm -hmm. of South America. That is the origin of it. So it is deep. It is in the DNA of African and indigenous people to be one, to have this struggle. It must go together because imperialism must die. Yes. And this is the heart of imperialism. And so, you know, I just, I just really wanna, wanna say that because I wanna wipe out this foul thing that anybody would think that the African revolution is for itself. It is there for all oppressed and colonized people, nobody, Nobody on this planet has taken a stand as deep and profound in genuine solidarity with every oppressed and colonized liberation struggle in the world than the African People's Socialist Party and the African Revolution. And the arrogance of white people to think that it would be something else mm -hmm. is, is really offensive. Yep. And it mm -hmm. is unity with genocide, with colonialism right. and mm -hmm. everything right. else. And so, you know, we have the ability, the honor to be under the leadership of the African Revolution, to find our humanity, to pay reparations, which is the African working class revolutionary demand for the redistribution of the wealth, because the stolen wealth is, is amassed inside of our white communities and it must be turned back over to the African Revolution, not to, you know, buying a drink for some African or some weird, mm -hmm. weird permutation of yeah. this mm -hmm. idea that, it, that is really offensive, but turning back over the stolen resources so that African people can have the value of their stolen land, their stolen labor, and their stolen resources to be able to um, build their socialist, their genuine socialist society under the leadership of the African working class and the African working class state. They can have unity with the indigenous people and oppressed and colonized peoples around the world. They have a place in it for white people. We have an assignment inside of white society, winning others just like ourselves to jump off this pedestal upon which we have sat since the beginning of capitalism and imperialism mm -hmm. and to, re to turn back over the stolen resources in the form of reparations. And I wanted to read, let's see, where did I have this? Oh yeah, I wanted to read one other thing because I think it is very, very beautiful. Mm -hmm. And this is a statement which is quoted in the book, Overturning the Culture of Violence, 
um, from Chief Stealth, also known as Seattle. <clears throat> and we were just in Seattle for the Day of Reparations to African People about, well, a week ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a week ago tonight, I think yep. it was. Yep. Or maybe tomorrow night. And it was very, very powerful. But so Chief Stealth made this statement, and I think it's very moving. It's a little uncommon between us. Of course, he's talking about white people. But why should I mourn the untimely fate of my people? Tribe follows tribe, nation follows nation, and regret is useless. Your time of decay may be distant. He said this, by the way, in 1855. But it will surely come, for even the white man cannot be exempt from the common destiny. We may be brothers after all, we will see. So he's like, you're going to get yours. And then he says, and when the last red man shall have perished, and the memory of my tribe shall have become a myth among the white men, these shores will swarm with invisible dead of my tribe. And when your children's children think themselves alone in the field, the store, the shop, upon the highway, or in the silence of the pathless woods, they will not be alone. At night when the streets of your cities and villages are silent and you think them deserted, they will throng with the returning hosts that once filled and still love this beautiful land. The white man will never be alone. Wow. That was very powerful and it is very true. And it also reminds me of the haunting words of Marcus Garvey as mm -hmm. that movement <clears throat> was being destroyed with the complicity of the white left mm -hmm. yep. and the US government um, that worked to destroy the movement of Marcus Garvey that had 11 million members of African people from all around the world and an incredible, um, an incredible convention of Negro peoples of the world in 1920, but also 21, 22, 23, 24, in which 25 to 50,000 African people came, including from every single country in Africa, every single island of the Caribbean, and every, almost every state of the United States. And his words as he was on the ship taking him to the Atlanta prison um, on trumped up charges and a counterinsurgency. In fact, it was the start of the career of J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI. Um, he made a beautiful, beautiful statement that said, look for me in the whirlwind. They cannot kill Marcus Garvey. Look for me in the whirlwind. And he talked about how African people will rise and take back their land and to be free and to be liberated. And so, this is the future, and we have the ability to be part of it, to um, an incredible honor, because we're part of a filthy, dirty system that must be destroyed, mm -hmm. that there is no rectification of it, there's no reform, there's no going back to a kinder, gentler imperialism and white power, because this is, we just showed, that this is how it was born, this is how it started and every president of the United States was completely involved in this, either as a slave master, a rapist, 13-year-old um, Sally Hemings like Thomas Jefferson, or a slave master and um, murderer of indigenous people like Andrew Jackson, who is upheld by our current president, mm -hmm. Trump. <laughs> And you know, just the same forces at work, the same forces at work mm -hmm. then as now, as now. And so we have the ability to be part of changing the world, to join humanity, to find our humanity for the first time and, and be part of something so much bigger than all of this self-centered you know, BS that's going around in our heads and in our brains to be part of, of something that takes responsibility for what white people have done, that pays reparations, and has a revolutionary assignment from the African Revolution by going into the white community and winning other white people just our, like ourselves. And I just want to say that we have some other 
contributions and reparations. Wow, a lot of them tonight. This All is right. very, very powerful. I want to also be able to, I want to give reparations of $55 tonight as well. Um, so Jesse, do you want to read some of the sure. people that we have here? First, I want to applaud you, Carolyn Kenny. That right. yeah. incredible, incredible presentation. And just everything that you just presented, the excerpts that you read and the overview that you gave. And I want to go back and transcribe parts of that, especially when you were talking about you know, w the difference between racism and colonialism and mm -hmm. how important that understanding is. So I just really appreciate um, having you on this program tonight and that presentation. And we want to thank you as well for your $55 contribution uh -huh. to our goal, as well as comrade Lisa Watson, who's putting in $100 oh, no! for Lisa. Uh -huh. We have Ali Aiello putting in $15 uh -huh. to comrade uh -huh. Ali. We have comrade Marissa, who put in $25. Oh, oh, oh. Coordinated an amazing, amazing day of reparations yes. for African people in Seattle. Yes. The coordinator of that did an amazing job. Amazing organizer, comrade Marissa. And we also have Ruby Gittleson, $25. Uhuru, Ruby. 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 Um, we have Melody, who put in $50. Uhuru Melody. to Melody. Uhuru. Uhuru. Melody. And we have APSC Secretary General Allison Haney, who put in $25 or huru to Secretary General mm -hmm. Alley. That brings us to 285 raised, 715 to go. So 340 raised with the oh, 55. Oh, I'm and Chairman Penny, yes. Excellent. So 340, so 660. That's nothing. We can we do it. We need to go ahead and let's Black make Power it happen. Let's make it happen. Yes. yes. We're already at $10,523. $10, We're going to make it to 11500 tonight. And twenty-three. It, yes, exactly. And I want to echo um, first my appreciation for that profound uh, statement that you made and all of those readings. It's so very clear what this is about, why we owe reparations, why this colonial system has to be overturned. And you're helping to make it happen uh, the, the, the way that you demonstrated how um, central the African Revolution is to the survival and the liberation of oppressed and colonized people the world over uh, is crystal clear. If this upsets you, if the history of the relationship that we have to indigenous people upsets you, it's your responsibility to take a stance in solidarity with the African Revolution and under the leadership of the African working class, especially if you're white. I want to thank everyone who's contributed. You can go to blackpowerblueprint.org yes. and continue to help us make that goal tonight. We're going to make it. I just want to, yeah, I just want to say, and again, I, I do want to salute everybody who has put in. We only need 660 more dollars. We can do this. Mm -hmm. We've done it many, many times, and we need to do it because the Black Power Blueprint is African workers creating mm -hmm. dual and contending power. Yeah. The, the, the seeds and the germs of the state power mm -hmm. of African mm -hmm. people where it's a revolutionary strategy that's brilliant, that's been used by all successful anti-colonial revolutions mm -hmm. where they take territory, the, the anti-colonial struggle under the leadership of the party takes territory and the people learn that they can govern themselves. They don't need the state. They don't need colonialism and the colonial state tries to say that it's, um, they, that you need it, it's indispensable, but it's right. not at all. The people can solve, there's so much talent and skills yeah. mm -hmm. in the African working class as we've seen. All the African contact tractors and workers who have worked on this, um, this project and just done a tremendous job under the leadership of Deputy Chair Ona Zanea Shetello, who's been out there with her steel-toed boots on and a construction hat for you know nine months or so or more, yeah. um, you know, making this happen, and you know, you, you just see this, the skills and the talent that are out there. But African workers can't work; mm -hmm. they can't. It's not like white contractors and that kind of thing. I also wanted to make the point that. When we look at this history that we were just reading, mm -hmm. um, you know, it shows you that the genocide was not a, like a surgical strike or right. no. something. It was, and the, and the same is true against Africans, um, the lynchings in this country yeah. or the way white settlers treated Africans, 
you know, in Africa, mm -hmm. as well as um, white settlers in Australia. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's not just kill somebody. It's torture. Yeah. It's oh, yeah. it's yeah. fun. It's a it's yep. you know this festival of violence and yep. white people gathered together right. and danced and had parties doing this stuff. Yeah. And then and ritualized so it into a holiday. And now it's a holiday. <laughs> yeah. And now it's a holiday where we're supposed to eat ourselves sick and, you know, and, and give thanks for this history. And, mm -hmm. I, you know, I just really, I know that because of the struggle of indigenous people in this country, that more and more cities are at least having to vote that the Columbus Day, which, of course, Columbus was the perpetrator, you know, mm -hmm. founding father of the genocide yeah. and began that in the Caribbean. And within 50 years, the Taino people in um, Haiti and the other places where he landed were completely wiped out yeah. through, you know, his voyages, through the, the genocide and, of course, his sons and the rape and everything that, that they did. And you can read his son's um, journals. Mm -hmm. That is in, I believe that is also in this book, American Holocaust. I mean, this has so much in it. It's mm -hmm. really a book you must have. Um, and it has the journals of the conquistadors and the journals of Columbus's sons, mm -hmm. um, which is like, you know, yeah. describing what they were doing to mm -hmm. people. Right. So, you know, it, this, is, this is the thing that um, it, it it's just this, this sickness. So we wonder, you know, well, why is it that all these white people just about every day are, and, and there's been several, like even this week, of uh, white people going into a public place and, or, mm -hmm. a, you know, a school or a movie theater or some kind of music festival and gunning down people. And why? Why? Yeah. Because this is in our DNA. Right, you know, exactly. we, we were saying how, I read that scientifically, that trauma um, experienced by enti an entire people is passed down through their DNA. That yeah. that's scientific. Yeah. That's not like some metaphysical thing. That's scientific. So, mm -hmm. is the gene or mm -hmm. the DNA for violence, for mass violence, is that passed down in our DNA? Yeah. And. I mean, I wouldn't think it would be, and it's just playing out here. Right. So when you see these mass shootings, these mass killings constantly, day after day, you can know that they're just repeating what it took, a little bit of what they took, mm -hmm. what it took to um, build the United States. Right. And as the chairman yeah. said, there would be no United States without slavery and genocide. There would mm -hmm. be no United States right. without that that it is essential to its nature. It's in the nature of the United States itself and capitalism. Yeah. So, you know, we have, to, we have to really recognize that. We have to use this opportunity to pay reparations to African and indigenous people by building the Black Power Blueprint, which yeah, is going yeah. to be part of the liberation of indigenous people. Mm -hmm. right. um, and we have Renee Nassar is giving Fifteen dollars tonight. So we only have six hundred and forty-five dollars left to raise. Oh, for real? We need that. We have something else here. Jackson Hollingsworth, five dollars. Jackson. Jackson. So we only have six hundred and forty left. So let's say, can somebody give that forty? Let's start with that forty, and let's whittle this away. Right. We're gonna yeah, we're gonna get there. Huru, I really appreciate that metaphor of the DNA. Um, ever since. Uh, it's been talked about uh, with respect to white power and the violence, the pillage, um, and how you know it's so embedded in our culture. Mm -hmm. But um, culture, like DNA, is mutable. It's able to be changed. Right. I've even heard that there are uh, types of genes that lay dormant in the body or the mind or you know wherever genes are in our in our organisms, mm -hmm. um, that mm -hmm. certain gene sequences can be flipped on if we make decisions and mm -hmm. or lay dormant. So it's time to flip on the reparations. Yeah, can, certain uh, actions can change yeah. the brain. 
Right. I read that. Yeah. And I they, read they, that too. They can change your entire DNA structure and then yeah. change, uh, you know, what you pass on if you have children or what and you pass on. And how you think and how mm -hmm. you reason and how you understand things. And African internationalism is a key one to that. Exactly. Right. Exactly. It's, it's like a, a, a... Seeing the world as it really is. Right. So it's... It, an army of <clears throat> genetic engineers is unnecessary. But, All right. <laughs> we want to salute Kever. Kever! Kever! $50. Let's okay, do it. so let's have somebody that can give at least 50, another 50. Put in another match, on. Kever. And if, yeah, if, if you're wondering, Kever went to blackpowerblueprint.org to make yes, that contribution. Yes, blackpowerblueprint.org. Go there right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, salute, salute to you, Kever, out there yes. organizing for the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. It's re really impressive stance that you've taken. And I just and, wanted to mm -hmm. say one thing about um, some of the points you were making, Chairman Penny, about the culture of violence and everything. Because I was thinking the same thing when you were reading those testimonies, that this wasn't just clean warfare going in, right. firing on, like, this was sadistic, mm -hmm. cruel, yeah. like, beyond any horror movie you're ever gonna see. That's right. Because mm -hmm. there's another holiday, Halloween, where people get dressed up as monsters and stuff. No Halloween costume or horror movie that you would see compares to that. Like right. the Texas Chainsaw mm -hmm. Massacre or whatever, I've seen a lot of them. None of them compare to the description of what regular white people carried out against indigenous people. Mm -hmm. And I just made me think of like even serial killers that you hear about, like Ted Bundy and, you know, that are like, you know, yeah. Yeah. bash women over the head and take them, cut their heads off and put them on sticks and everything. It's like, why is that shocking? That's like, you can't create a whole society by doing that. And then be like, okay, don't do it anymore. You can't, it's not gonna happen anymore. Okay, mm -hmm. we just did that to millions of people, but now it's just not gonna happen at all right. in, in whites. Of course it is. It's gonna reflect the origins of, of the culture and the social system. And the only way to overturn that is total defeat of imperialism and the liberation of African and indigenous people. Mm -hmm. And I also really appreciated what you said about the fact, you know, this question, well, what about the Native Americans, quote yeah. unquote, that we get? Because 99.999% of the time, it's a completely disingenuous question. Because like you said, what are you doing about the indigenous people, like suddenly? Because when somebody asks me that, I say, yes, the, the part of the Uhuru movement stands in unconditional solidarity with the indigenous people taking back all of their land. This is their land. And they're like, oh, I don't know about that. I'm like, well, wait, what happened to your pretend sympathy for the indigenous right. people? Right. So, I mean, this is the movement that yeah. is for the liberation of the indigenous people. And, yes. and an honest white person who wants to fight for the liberation of the indigenous people can see that in the party and will join the Uhuru Solidarity Movement and fight for reparations to African people, which is, like you said, attacks the, the core of the social system and the government and imperialism that is the main thing that stands in the way of the indigenous people in their land mm -hmm. that they have a right to reclaim. So if, if you're a white person and you want to stand for the liberation of the indigenous people of the so-called Americas, then there's no greater step you can take than joining this movement, working under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party and going to blackpowerblueprint.org and paying reparations to the Black Power Blueprint. Because this project is tied to an international strategy mm -hmm. to forward the liberation and unification of Africa and African people everywhere in unity with all oppressed and colonized peoples, including, fundamentally including, the indigenous people of this land. So yes. that's what you can do. So we're not mm -hmm. saying don't go to Standing Rock or anything like that. But we are saying that if you want to be tied to the struggle to totally end this social system, not just the struggle to win certain rights or concessions along the way, but to get rid of it altogether so the indigenous people are, have repossession of their land, then this is the place to be. Mm -hmm. The Uhuru movement, the Solidarity movement, the Black Power Blueprint. And, and that's why we're having this, this webinar. So I encourage you. Where, what are we at, 590? 590, so let's get, we need somebody to give 90. Yes. 90, you got us to 500, halfway 90, there. And then we're gonna whittle it down, but we're gonna get there, because yes. this is really critical. This is something that is changing the world. Yes. And it, you know, that the African working class, the chairman explains, is the key force against imperialism from right. within, because yeah. there's an urban, working class that is huge yeah. that even the U.S. government has said is the weak link, mm -hmm. you know, which is the, the African working class 
taking a revolutionary stand has been called by the FBI the greatest internal threat to the U.S. government since the Civil War. Right. So the U.S. government is very aware of that. The African working class has the ability to be a revolutionary force, as it did in the 60s, that galvanized the indigenous people, the Chicano, the Spanish-speaking indigenous people, you know, the indigenous people of the northern U.S., and the Puerto Rican community, and you know, just all of the colonized forces inside the U.S. were, were galvanized by the African liberation movement of the 1960s. Mm -hmm. right. You know, I just also wanted to make another little point here is that it makes very clear in these readings, white people scalped Africans. Right, yes. This whole thing of scalping. Yeah. Everything that imperialism does to something yep. else, it blames it on the colonized yeah. people. Exactly. And it still does that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know, it still does that today. But scalping, taking, you know, cutting off the yeah. top of the head of human beings was a European practice. Of course. Um, yeah. A very hideous <clears throat> European practice. Yep. And um, along with all other types of mutilation yeah. of human bodies. And when you know, you see that on TV sometimes they'll talk about that. And it's yeah. a completely different way that they talk about white history um, as well, this was a part of their ritual and just something they did. Whereas when they show indigenous people, yeah. they gloss over the incredible achievements. Yeah. And, and get right to these sensational lies, as far as I'm concerned, about um, yeah. what indig indigenous culture was like yeah. before white people got here as a way to justify the slaughter. Yes. We want to quickly shout out uh, Kyle Vies, who put in $15. Um, and right. I really haven't put it in yet. Have you? He's going to put it in. <laughs> right on, so Kyle. once Kyle does that, that will bring us to having raised 425 meaning we have 570 Yes, 575 left to go. So we're almost halfway there. Go to blackpowerblueprint.org. And let's put in that 75. Yes, let's yes. get it to halfway. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was just looking for something. I mean, because, you know, the way that white people, like it said, I mean, it turned it into this, you know, they talk about um, sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. I mean, sexual violence yeah. is a weapon of war. Right. right? A weapon of imperialist colonial war, mm -hmm. yep. and so you know it, it. It always has been from the beginning, and it's there to demoralize, to demoralize, to degrade the people, to bring them down, to humiliate, to try yeah. to to destroy their humanity and their will to fight, mm -hmm. and it's just you know, this is what the system does. Mm -hmm. And it has all of these things called the Geneva Convention for white people right. when it fights Europeans, but when it, it has a war of occupation against a colonized people inside the borders of the United States or anywhere else, um, it's whatever, it, it's the sky's the limit. They do anything that they want to do, and it's right. all about demoralization. And this is what they have done to Africans, mm -hmm. you know, to just destroy, to attempt to destroy the self-image and the will to live and fight and to liberate themselves. And this, yeah. is, this is what white people have done, and it's, it's, it's sick. It is, and it, it, everything you've been over, I just want to unite that you, it's the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. that this was not a surgical strike, mm -hmm. this was not some sort of aberration, um, this was routine behavior mm -hmm. yeah. for a, a parasitic genocidal population um, that, that didn't have to get a direct memo uh, for, for right. whom it became a way of life right. to um, slaughter these people like, like insects. Um, right. like, and it's... And if I may, James, yeah, uh, please we do have, interrupt we have a me. Good news. Uh, well, it's not not exactly good news, but okay. it, it is good news because it means people are watching, people are curious, and want to ask questions. Which we encourage you to do so if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook. Uh, please leave a comment if you have a question for our speaker, and uh, we will address it. So this is a question from Philip. No, sorry, Rick Barnett. What exactly does this have to do with Thanksgiving traditions? Well, 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 as we said, everything. Thanksgiving is a holiday that gives thanks mm -hmm. for the genocide of the indigenous people so mm -hmm. that we, what, what are we being thankful for? Right. right. Yeah. What are we being thankful for? Having 
prosperity built yeah. on slavery, mm -hmm. on land stolen from the indigenous people that whose genocide was carried out against them. Right. What, you know, yeah. this is what is the foundation of the U.S. society, of white society, and white people sit on the pedestal of that oppression. So. Um, this is a colonial holiday. This is mm -hmm. a colonial holiday celebrating genocide. And if you believe that, you know, that indigenous people have a right to be free, to have their land, um, to have control over their lives and not live in concentration camps called reservations, which, which has the highest poverty and one of the, lo the lowest life expectancy of any people inside U.S. borders, if you believe that indigenous people must be free, self-determining, and that there has to be justice, there has to be the ability of, Af of indigenous people to have control over their lives and to return this to a beautiful place that, mm -hmm. that existed, then go ahead and, and put in resources now. I see that Amanda Carlazzi is put in $25 Excellent. So we just need five hundred and sixty-five more dollars. So let's say, can somebody put in sixty-five dollars right now, or maybe seventy, and we would be under five hundred dollars. There you go. And we would be over halfway there, and that's that's yes. what we need. There, there couldn't be a better investment than the Black Power Blueprint. Okay. Right, and and we're I, th I think we're, what we're talking about is changing our culture here. This this uh, tradi the traditions of Thanksgiving, like Chairwoman. Penny has said is getting together and stuffing ourselves as full of food or alcohol, candy, and it's all about celebrating that we have this, celebrating that we're here on stolen land, right. living on a pedestal built off of the proceeds of slavery, mm -hmm. of the theft of human beings as the original startup capital. Thanksgiving is saying thank you for that, just as we heard uh, our so-called president this morning or this afternoon there was the traditional pardoning of a couple of turkeys that alone Thank is problematic know. is obscene yeah. we have the largest prison population on planet earth and at least half of those prisoners are african people and incredibly disproportionate one out of every eight prisoners on planet earth is an african man in the united states of america right and yet we have the u.s president standing up there today um, gloriously engaging in this down-home tradition of pardoning a turkey and um, you know gives his entire executive weight to this decision with pomp and circumstance and and emphasizes how blessed we should all count ourselves to be Americans mm -hmm. and I, I want to know so, so what, is, what does that say if we're not Americans what if we, what if we live in the Congo what if somebody lives in, in the Philippines? Does that mean that they're cursed? There's a dialectical relationship between the wealth that white Americans experience and the poverty and oppression that the rest of the world experiences. Yeah, and that is their experience of capitalism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It takes that yeah. to have uh, capitalism as white people experience it. Right. We so, want to give a shout mm -hmm. out to comrade Rene Nassar who put in an additional $15. All right. All right. Okay. 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 So that means uh, we've raised 450, 550 left to go. Well, let's put in the 50. Left. Let's yes. put in the put 50 in now. 50. Let's go ahead and put in the 50. Blackpowerblueprint.org. This is for the future. This is for the uh, for your children, for the life of this planet. Yeah, and, it is. you know, I just want to say, too, that, I mean, I've read some really statements, some old statements of by indigenous people. And one of the things that they always raised was about the environment. Mm -hmm. You know, that I read a statement that um, indigenous man made, and this book was written maybe in 1918 or 1920. Yeah. And the indigenous man was saying, well, you know, you've killed the buffalo. Who's going to take its place? You know, you've killed the gray fox, you know, whatever you, who's going to take its place? Don't you know that that leaves a hole? Mm -hmm. So he said that leaves a hole because it's an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And that, that the indigenous people, you know, there was no problem with the environment when indigenous people had, had their lives and, yep. and had their civilizations and power 
you know, over their own communities. There was no problem with the environment when African people had control of Africa. That this destruction of the environment is part and parcel of the genocide against the indigenous people because it doesn't stop. I mean, human beings are part of the ecosystem, a critical part. Mm -hmm. We can't separate ourselves from that. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're saying that now, that the environment is so destroyed that 80% of insects are gone. I still, and we wow. can't live without it. I mean, insects are part of the chain of, you know, of human beings, of beings, of living beings, mm -hmm. and certainly of the food chain. And, you know, it's the system that would just wipe out hundreds of millions mm -hmm. of African indigenous people, also Filipinos, Indians from India, um, Vietnamese and Southeast Asians, and how many millions of people? Yeah. How many millions yeah. has it wiped out? You know, it, it just it baffles the brain to be able yeah. to even ponder this and consider it and to think that this is the pedestal upon which we sit. No wonder we are committing suicide and have deaths of despair and can only live by taking drugs or drinking every mm -hmm. single day or just think, oh, get it all, I'm just committing suicide. Mm -hmm. right? No wonder, because when we start, you know, just brushing the surface of this and we see that it, it, we can't live with it. You know, we read this and, uh, you know, it's like, oh my God, I, you know, that right. you can't walk away from that and right. just go to business as usual. You have to really, really look at it and what it, it will take to change this world. Mm -hmm. So the stand of reparations is one thing that it will take. Yes. So, you and know, and it's, it's really an incredible time that we live in. It is. We're lucky we're, to, to be seeing this crisis in imperialism. And it is a crisis, make no mistake, for um, white power right now. And we, we see that in all different types of uh, ways. And um, as Chairman Amalia Shatella has said, as you've said, Chairwoman Penny, we can't allow that to be our crisis. Mm -hmm. We have to stand on the forward side of history. And that's what we're talking about right now. That's why we're talking about this um, incredibly gluttonous, um, you know, uh, this celebration of genocide, mm -hmm. which is what Thanksgiving is. And we, and we, we reject that outright. I don't want to say I'm thankful for um, blood money, for a land that was, the, whose indigenous peoples were exterminated. Right. That's not something I'm proud of. That's not something that I want to get together with my friends and family and celebrate. So Real. we're talking about a new world. We're talking about a new world that's opening up, uh, that the African revolution is, is leading. And mm -hmm. we get to be a part of it. You can yeah. be a part of that by going to blackpowerblueprint.org and giving generously tonight. James uh -huh. White, fifty dollars. Uh, right, James White. James White. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So fantastic. All right, James White. We are thankful for you, James White, and yes. for everybody else that has put in today to bring us to five hundred dollars of our overall goal of a thousand. And we have about ten minutes before we start going into announcements, which means that we'll have ten minutes of our announcements being interrupted by you continuing to put in contributions towards our goal. Um, but you. in those last ten minutes, you know, we do want to really encourage everyone, everyone who's watching tonight to, to donate whatever you can, to mm -hmm. pay reparations at whatever amount. Even if it's $5, $10, $50, any amount, mm -hmm. it makes a big difference. Yeah. Every single amount makes a big difference. It goes directly towards this program, the Black Power Blueprint, that we've already seen, like you said, in less than a year, because of the work of Deputy Chair Onizanea Shatella and the African workers on the ground in St. Louis, and because of the support from you, who are watching this and the reparations that this abandoned building was transformed into this beautiful, amazing political community center, the Uhuru House there in North St. Louis. And that's mm -hmm. just the beginning. It's just mm -hmm. the beginning. So that's what the resources go towards. And it's almost immediate. That money, like you take out your card, you put in the numbers and like almost immediately it's being put into action. It translates into real, tangible, concrete work happening on the ground in St. Louis where the African working class are transforming the material conditions that they are, they are experiencing and fighting for self-determination, real self-determination and power yes. in their own hands. So that's what this is about. And we want to again mm -hmm. urge you 
uh, to go to blackpowerblueprint.org and put in whatever you can. Even if you've already contributed, be like Renee. She put in 15 and then 45 minutes later, she put in another 15. So be like Renee, go to blackpowerblueprint.org and, and do everything you can. Uhuru. 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 And along those lines, I'm going to be like Renee and expose how down to the nub I am this month. But $15 from myself. All right. Someone else, match me. Come on, I know you're out there. It's not easy to say you have $15, hey, but come on. $15. Some, someone sure. else, let's as, hear from the 15 another, uh, down to the nub uh, <laughs> person, I'm, I'm gonna throw in another 15 as well. All right, come on, right. right. For those of you who are equally at nub level, <laughs> sorry, uh, go to blackpowerblueprint.org and put in $15, $15. Right. It makes a huge difference, so. So that's $30, yes. so we've raised 530 and we have All right. 470 left. All right, it's time to call the rich cousins, I'm, I'm the rich I'm gonna put uncles. that in right now, take out my wallet. Excellent. Go ahead and do it right, All right. now, so. And um, yeah, this you know, as you said earlier, Chairwoman. Again, if anyone isn't aware, we're here tonight speaking with Chairwoman Penny Hess of the African People's Solidarity Committee, and Jesse Neville of the African People's Solidarity Committee, and Chair of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. And we're talking about the lie of Thanksgiving, yeah. right? And um, how the genocide it took to build the United States, to build white power, to build the kind of lifestyle that white people the world over have come to take for granted was a popular genocide. It was a genocide that we didn't, we didn't get forced into. Mm -mm. We, we weren't threatened with a gun to our head. This is something uh, that, that became a family affair from the lynching of African people to the uh, death squads against the indigenous. It was popular genocide. So we need a popular reparations yes. movement to go. counter that. That's exactly what we need. So we're calling on you yes. to make that word, make reparations go viral tonight. And yes, and even more Tune specifically, what we mm -hmm. need is $470 remaining yes. towards our goal tonight. So go ahead and do what I'm doing right now. I'm putting, putting in my postal code and clicking finish so that that uh, reparations can go straight to the Black Power Blueprint. So uh -huh. go ahead, blackpowerblueprint.org. We only need 470 more. That. That, that is so little. It that is. is yeah. so little. It is. That's what 47 people doing $10. Yeah. I mean, 470 is probably an average amount that it costs mm -hmm. for a Thanksgiving dinner. Exactly. For yeah. those turkeys that don't get pardoned. Yes. And right. For all of the wine and alcohol wine and, and champagne stuffing. And and Yes. All the exactly. pumpkin pies, which hopefully are from Uhuru Foods and Pies. <laughs> the candies that start this time of year, you know, and th this is this is something. Paula is giving fifteen dollars. All right, Paula. Uhuru. There we go. Fantastic. Okay, so we Keep it have. Up. Um, so that brings us to four hundred and fifty-five. Four hundred and fifty-five. So somebody should put in sixty put now, in? and that would put us under four hundred dollars. So who can put in sixty? We can Go do ahead it. and put in 60. Let's do this. We can do this. We have social wealth. Mm -hmm. Yes. We have the ability to have resources, to get them, to even, yeah. even when we're poor. Mm -hmm. Right. White people, poor white people, impoverished white people have an easier time raising $3,000 yep. in an emergency than the African petty bourgeoisie or middle class does. Yes. Right. Because we have social wealth, because we have the cousin, because we have somebody. Yep. Mm -hmm who went to college or whatever, has the big McMansion somewhere, right. Right. got the money, got the bucks, and you know we have access to that. Mm -hmm. This is part of, and the reason that we have that is because of the wealth generated by the enslavement of African people and the theft of this land. Would you right. know that, um, how many acres did the US give away? Give away, they had a thing. Um, the 40 acres in a, no, no, not no. the 40, I'm saying, they, they stole right. the indigenous land. Oh, David Rold put another 15. All right, David Rold. David Rold. Thank you. Uh -huh. A nonstop supporter I need mean to look it up, but they did a thing where they took a humongous amount of indigenous land and then they, they gave it away to white settlers for mm -hmm. free. And they had this sort of race. Oh, the everybody. homestead? Yeah, homesteading yes. and all this mm -hmm. stuff. Mm. And you could have a plot of land if you went there and farmed it. And that's how Kansas, Nebraska, Colorado, all that, you know, they gave away, the U.S. gave away that land. And, you know, if I'm not mistaken, they kept that program or some form of it alive 
all the way up into the early part of the century. It might be still going now. It might be. Someone out there might know that. Um, but yeah, I remember white people using that and getting a lot of money, a lot of land yeah. in Tennessee. I think it's some, something like land. 70 acres. That's how, that's how white people got land. Yeah. That is how white people got land, and that's the colonizer. That's the colonizer right. nation. And right. And, and, and they got farms, too. They, they, they got crops. They got all the science that indigenous people had built here. Um, they, they didn't just come and take, you know, like, as they call it, virgin land, a term that's really offensive. But this land was developed. Mm -hmm. there, there were farms from sea to, to shining sea, well, as yeah, they the say. Well, yeah, the Trail of Tears... Um, indig the um, indigenous people had the land in the Appalachians and mm -hmm. you know in the Smoky Mountain areas and the US government they had houses and land and farmed land mm -hmm. and when the Trail of Tears came they had that day to get out and go with right. whatever is on their backs okay, to I walk just, across. I wanted to thank uh, Paula, who was mentioned, as well as Mads Ambrose, uh -huh. an amazing comrade in Portland, who, who just, coordinated, kept, just yeah. coordinated one of the most successful days of reparations to African people that gained 20 new members of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. Mads Ambrose, who put in $50 tonight, uh -huh. uh -huh. bringing us to 610 meaning only 390, 390 left dollars. to go. It and we was, have a few minutes to make that happen. And it was just a few minutes ago that we were talking about 600 something. Exactly. Yeah. So, so let's so keep it going. we can do this. this. We can do this. Yes. We can do this. Just go ahead. I'm going to put in my pledge as soon as this event is over. I'm going to go there and put it in so you can see. And you'll have to do the same too as any your address. Oh, okay. No worries. Gotcha. <laughs> So we thank you to everyone who's already donated, yes. and uh, we, we really appreciate this spirit of uh, reparations, and um, we know that it's going to keep up. We know that it's going to keep up to next week, yes. and th this is how we've gotten this far, and it's, it's not the path of least resistance, as um, has been said in the African People's Socialist Party before. This, this is the movement that made reparations a household word. This, this is the organization that has been uh, forming tribunals on reparations since 1982. Am I correct, yes, Chairwoman? Yes, since correct. 1982. Yeah. And it is now a household word. It's almost to come down to the question of what do you mean when you mean reparations? Do you mean revolutionary reparations like the African People's Socialist Party uh, means? Or do you mean some other form of accommodating uh, this system? And this is the only movement I know of that will not compromise with this okay. system. So um, we're doing it from the ground up, and it's, it's a beautiful process. It's an honor to be part of it. Go to blackpowerblueprint.org and make your contribution now, or go ahead and send that message to that uh, relative or friend you have who hasn't yet had a chance to get on this side of history. Mm -hmm. So um, while you are going to blackpowerblueprint.org, uh, Jamie, I think we should yeah. go into some announcements that we have for all of our viewers tonight. And I just want to give another round of applause to all of you, Uhuru. Studio as well, audience. As well, yes, our studio audience, mm -hmm. as well as uh, Chairwoman Penny Hess for all of the amazing statements on this program tonight. Uhuru. She is a Thank leader and a scholar. All right, so um, we want to, again, thank the donors and um, all of your, your wonderful statements and contributions and this, this economic development that's fighting gentrification and building African economic and political renaissance. So the announcements. Next webinar will be next Tuesday, 7 p.m., Tuesday night, featuring Chairman Omalia Shatella and Chairwoman, <laughs> and Chairwoman Penny Hess for Giving Tuesday for blackpowerblueprint.eventbrite.com. Again, this is for Giving Tuesday, and the website is, all one word, Giving Tuesday for blackpowerblueprint.eventbrite.com. Please go, go there, and what we're doing is we're turning this, this uh, tradition. It's another tradition surrounding yeah. uh, Thanksgiving. Uh, we, there's Cyber Monday, where people go and buy everything they can buy to give uh, gifts of meaning to their loved ones on Monday. And on Tuesday is Giving Tuesday. So we want to turn this into a Reparations Tuesday event. Yes. And that's 7 p.m. Tuesday night. 
And again, you can get started on this now by going and making yourself um, your own Giving Tuesday site at givingtuesdayforblackpowerblueprint.eventbrite.com. Yeah, let me yeah. just say, explain that a little bit because Giving Tuesday is a, is a day that's been formulated that is usually around the 27th mm -hmm. or, you know, it's a Tuesday, obviously, um, after this holiday. Mm -hmm. And it's a chance for nonprofit organizations to raise resources from their base. And the African People's Education and Defense Fund, which is APDF, the Uhura Furniture Stores are part of that, and Black Power Blueprint is part of that as well. And it, it enables you know, this APEDF to go online to get all of its base to do a fundraiser for Giving Tuesday that goes, it's a day that people give tremendously mm -hmm. towards an important cause or um, event and um, you can make a Giving Tuesday fundraiser for your Facebook page, I think also for Twitter, I think, but I'm not sure. And th that's why you have to sign up at Giving Tuesday for Black Power Blueprint dot Eventbrite dot com. Mm -hmm. So if anybody, um, you know, didn't get that, <laughs> you know, you can email us at info at blackpowerblueprint.org but we you know we can sign you up because you can ask your own friends and your own base to give to to this giving tuesday which is going to be resources for the black power blueprint so go ahead and and be part of it i think we already have close to a hundred people mm -hmm. at least and our goal is 200 people so you know it's it's tremendously successful it's something that a lot of people will do um, it enables your friends and family to support this as well. So we really want everybody to participate in it. Yeah. We really appreciate else. that. And I'll, I'll just read that one more time. It's giving Tuesday for Black Power Blueprint dot eventbrite dot com. And that's F O R. Yes. F O R. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Giving Tuesday F O R black power blueprint dot eventbrite dot com and you can sign up there and um, people will be in touch with yeah. you you can too. get your own account you can do it on, oh. in your own name you can do it in your family's name it's mm -hmm. and it's pretty self-explanatory it'll take you yeah. through the process so yeah. that's a great way to turn giving tuesday into reparations tuesday yes absolutely uh -huh. jesse uh -huh. yes so giving tuesday it's coming up i just mm -hmm. want to uh, unite with all of that and by the way, we're not done raising reparations tonight, so please continue going to blackpowerblueprint.org yes. and putting in reparations towards our goal. And I wanted to announce that something similar to Giving Tuesday that you can do uh, to support the Black Power Blueprint is make your birthday an act of reparations to African people mm -hmm. by doing a birthday for black power coordinated by the National Secretary of the Uhura Solidarity Movement, Comrade Ali Ayello. And that is a very easy way that anybody can be involved in making, uh, in raising reparations for this project. You can do it through Facebook and you can uh, email us at info at uhurusolidarity.org. If you're interested, you will get instructions on how to do that from Ali um, and that committee on how to set up a Facebook, a fundraiser on your own page that on your birthday, it, it promotes it from your page. You can invite your friends, your family, and even people you don't know. I, some people I didn't know before who I'm very grateful for, went on there and contributed towards my birthday fundraiser. So Yeah, um, so Jesse and I just had birthdays on the same day for whatever indeed. reason. <laughs> and on you know, two weeks ago and we both did one and you know, we each raised over five hundred dollars. Yep. And I wanna yep. thank like my two sisters and some old friends. I wanna thank my dad. Thank who you. put in I mean that was so great. Yeah. You know, it was really, really a chance for my family to support the Black yeah. Power Blueprint and all kinds of things like that. So that also is a lot of fun yeah. and it's just really great to do. Absolutely. So you can uh, do that. You can also do a reparations challenge, mm -hmm. which can mean literally anything, anything that you are already doing, cultural activity, social activity, turn it into a fundraiser for the Black Power Blueprint. Yes. And we have uh, Comrade Mads is the coordinator of that. You can do... Uh, a yoga, a, a yoga, a yoga event, a yoga fundraiser. You can do a dance party. You can do a. We had a chocolate making workshop once. You can make detergent. That's you can make natural. laundry detergent. Make your own laundry detergent. Yes. You can literally do any, anything that you know how to do. You want to teach other people how to do it. Do a skill training workshop. 
anything. You know, you can walk someone's dog. You can do anything to. We're building a culture of reparations to African people. So and that's the reparations challenge. And would anybody like to like ride their bike from Seattle to San Diego with a whole group of people? And we could. You could stop in Portland and Oakland and San Francisco, in LA and San Diego, all the way down the coast, and have events. We could have press conferences. Wouldn't that be fun? Yeah, I really that would be want great. to do that. Like a modern march against genocide. Yeah, yeah. only you're riding your bike. Yeah. All right, so I'm sure somebody out there is interested in doing that. Kyle looks interested. <laughs> so somebody wants to do that. So I, I want to do it. Penny wants to do it. I okay, do so it. we got people signing <laughs> up. That so that's the up. reparations challenge. And then we have the Uhuru Solidarity Movement National Convention, which will, uh, let, me sit, let me put it this way, almost certainly will be on, uh, April 13th and 14th, but exact dates to be determined or confirmed dates to be announced in the near future. But mark your calendar, at least for now, with a pencil, um, April 13th and 14th, and that will be in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, the USM National Convention, where members, supporters of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement from all over the country, and this year we hope from even from Australia and other places will come to St. Louis to the headquarters of the Black Power Blueprint. Here, Chairman Penny has speak. Here, Chairman Omali Ashitella our keynote speaker, and hear from all of the other members and leaders of USM reporting on our work and talking about the way forward to build the solidarity movement in the upcoming year. So those are the announcements that I wanted to make. And I just I want wanted to say one more thing. Yes. That we really want to salute the comrades in Australia who yes. also held the Day of Reparations to Absolutely. African people. Mm -hmm. They're the, for the first time ever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to end the colonial population, the settler colonizers yeah. of Australia, um, Comrade George and Molly. others, Molly and others who, yes. who came out, they raised 900 Australian dollars, which yes. is really, really powerful. Yes. And are really excited to build. And also, we are coming to Occupy Zania, aka South Africa, where the African People's Socialist Party has a growing um, organization in Hauteng province, which is the richest province in South Africa, where Johannesburg is the cap capital of that, where there are um, 14 million people in that province, and only 15% of them are white, but yet, of course, white people own the vast majority of all those resources. Mm -hmm. So we're coming. You yeah. can join USM in Occupy Zania or South Africa. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a whole new day, and we're very excited. We're going to be doing this in 2019. Yes. So let us know Definitely. if you're from South Africa, if you want to be part of the forward side of history, contact us. Uhuru. 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 If you know people there, let us know. There's a way you can be part of the future, too. Wherever you are on this planet, yes. if you're white, there's a way out of this burning slave ship. And it's yep. called the Uhuru Solidarity Uhuru Movement. Movement under and the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party and the Stand of Reparations. The Uhuru. only difference Life. between a white settler in the U.S. or Australia or South Africa is the accent. Yep. We all owe reparations to African people, Uhuru. and we all have a responsibility to join this movement and build solidarity with black power. Uhuru. 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 So do we have any more? Yes, we have one more announcement. Or announcement, please, yes. Well, you, um, can, you can read sales. it. Sales. <clears throat> Forgive All right, me. Planet Uhuru. Thank right, you. I don't know what happened with that. Sorry about that. Here we go. Here Planet we go. Uhuru Revolutionary Apparel will be participating in a Black Friday and Cyber Monday sale this weekend from November 23rd to November 26th. All orders, $25 or more, will receive a 20% discount. Okay, so you see this shirt right here. That is an Uzi uh, shirt, uh, yeah, this I believe. Is by so, Uzi so check out Uzi as well in Pedum. And this is also from uh, Planet Uhuru mm -hmm. Revolutionary Apparel and 20% discount all sales fund black self-determination projects like the Black Power Blueprint. You can buy black power this holiday season by visiting planetuhuru.com for a whole assortment of new items including custom apparel, journals, mittens, vintage pins from the USSR. And those mittens are fabulous, hand-knitted by a comrade's mother, comrade Mara's mother, and they're wool, they're beautiful, I just love them. They're very nice, very colorful, and very comfortable. Yes. Uh, vintage pins from the USSR and a pre-sale for the 2019 Uhuru calendar. Hmm. All right, 2019 is coming up, oh, so yeah. you should get your pre-sale in. Excellent. All right, so that's our last announcement. And um, please oh. go to blackpowerblueprint.org. You don't have to stop just because the webinar is over. You can keep contributing we reparations. We need 390 more dollars. 390 we can left do to go. this. Mm -hmm. 
Keep so, up the momentum, yeah. comrades. We really appreciate, really appreciate everyone it. who participated tonight through, through con uh, contributing, uh, through comments. Thank you. And uh, please join us next Tuesday, the 27th, for the Giving Tuesday and uh, the opportunity to hear from Chairman Omali Yeshitela yes. uh, of the African People's Socialist Party, 7 p.m. Um, next Tuesday, November 27th. Yes. So I, I want to say thank you again, and especially to Chairwoman Penny Hess, our keynote speaker, and to Jesse Neville, Chair of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. My name is Jamie Simpson. Thank you to our incredible yes. uh, crew here and in-studio audience, and um, everyone out there, we want to say unity through revolutions! Uhuru! Uhuru!